Go. Good morning. I'm Leela Abed, the Deputy Director at the Mexico Institute, and I want to welcome you all again to the eighth annual Building a Competitive U.S.-Mexico Border Conference. I want to thank everybody that is here in person and everybody that is joining us virtually. I will be moderating panel number three, focused on collaboration at the subfederal level. We will kick off this session with a video greeting from Congresswoman Veronica Escobar. Hi everyone, I'm Congresswoman Veronica Escobar and I am so proud to represent the safe and secure border community of El Paso, Texas. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the Wilson Center, Mexico Institute and Border Trade Alliance for gathering such an exceptional group of lawmakers, diplomats and policy leaders. I also want to thank each of you for being here to contribute your expertise and leadership to these important conversations about the U.S.-Mexico border. As a lifelong El Pasoan who lives in El Paso and who raised her children in the community, I implore you all to focus on the principles of collaboration, innovation, and dignity in every discussion you have about the border. Centering these core values will ensure that any border processes we develop are beneficial, effective, and efficient. This year, I joined leaders from New Mexico and the state of Chihuahua for our first meeting of the Binational Infrastructure Task Force. We may be representatives from three separate states and two different countries, but we are undeniably one region that works best when we view each other as collaborators and partners with shared goals not as competitors. Knowing that our neighbor's success is also our own, we discussed long and short-term projects and policy recommendations for infrastructure improvement between our states and countries, especially our land ports between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. My vision for our ports of entry between Mexico and the United States is partly inspired by our airports. Passing through security there, you'll witness a system that focuses on customer service and the ability to efficiently process large groups of people, substantially more dignified than what we see today at land ports. The Jersey barriers, overworked OFO officers, severe traffic backlogs, and the subsequent pollution highlight the long time lack of serious investments in our ports from the federal government. It's unacceptable inefficient and inhumane. It's crucial that when addressing irregular immigration and the processing of asylum seekers with dignity, we require ourselves to think innovatively and work strategically to create a multifaceted solution. I've asked Secretary Blinken to push the State Department to establish more in-country asylum processing programs. I've asked Secretary Mayorkas to support the creation of a program that uses civilian personnel rather than law enforcement to process vulnerable populations under a planned central processing center in El Paso by the Department of Homeland Security. Last year, I introduced the Reimagining Asylum Process Act, which creates humanitarian processing centers for those apprehended at ports of entry to receive resources like an orientation, legal counsel, interpreters, and medical screenings. We know the benefits of collaboration and innovation at our border. We have the chance at this point in our nation's history to see our 30 years of immigration challenges as opportunities. Opportunities that will benefit our economy and climate in addition to migrants around the world. I will continue to be a vessel for immigration reform, calling on my colleagues in Congress to pass meaningful policy that meets the challenges and the opportunities of today and tomorrow. Dangerous, inflammatory, and xenophobic rhetoric targeted toward migrants today conveys that new policy is not just needed, but long overdue. I'm hopeful that my efforts will serve as a component to the underlying message that our relationships with one another, especially on the U.S.-Mexico border, must be nurtured to produce real progress that exemplifies dignity and humanity. I hope you enjoy your remaining time at the 8th Annual Border Conference and continue to use your expertise to improve our nation. Thank you. We thank uh, Congresswoman Escobar for her remarks. 
And now I have the great pleasure of introducing Maru Campos, who is the governor of the state of Chihuahua. Prior to her current position, she was mayor of the city of Chihuahua. During her long career in civil service, she served as the member, as a member, sorry, of the Federal Congress for Chihuahua, delegate for Liconza in Chihuahua, and advised the Federal Electricity Commission on social issues. She holds a bachelor's degree in law and master's and a master's in public policy and administration from the Monterey Institute of Technology and Higher Education, and a master's in government and Latin American studies from Georgetown. University. Governor Maru Campos, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the Wilson Center. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lila. I'm so glad to, to be here. I'm very, very grateful for the invitation uh, for the Woodrow Wilson Center. Thank you for this invitation to participate in this panel and be able to talk about what we're doing uh, as a Chihuahua state government for our borders and, of course, for our people. For Chihuahua state government, cross-border cooperation is a priority. Let me tell you that Chihuahua state is a member of several commissions and binational groups between New Mexico and Texas. Each group between New Mexico and Texas uh, has a commission work in the different capabilities like economic development, transportation, security, education, health, among others. With the commitment of sharing best practice and elaborate a common plan that benefit border governments. To mention a few binational groups, I can mention like the most important, which, which are, uh, for example, the New Mexico Border Transportation Master Plan, the New Mexico Border Trade Ad Advisory Committee, and uh, the Tax Force New Mexico, El Paso, and Chihuahua, which was recently created. And it was an initiative by the ambassador of the US in Mexico, the ambassador Ken Salazar. Some of these commissions and working groups were inactive in previous administration, but this year we have given ourselves the compromise of reactivating and established contact with the governments of New Mexico and Texas. As an example, this year, Chihuahua State Government will host the Binational Commission between New Mexico and Chihuahua. This commission works through different work tables in which both parts enlist priorities and develop plan actions on educational, cultural, health, health and security, economic development matters. On the other hand, we have the Binational Infrastructure Task Force, which was formed in February under the Ambassador Ken Salazar Initiative. This task force was created with the objective of engaging with public and private, private stakeholders from each region, from each region. That means New Mexico, Texas, and Chihuahua. To be fully competitive and empower this economic region, we have the compromise to modernize our regional border infrastructure through several efforts between different levels of governments. San Jeronimo, for example, is a port of entry which uh, has its limits with New Mexico and is a priority for President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. And we have been working very closely with federal government to follow up on the steps. For this project, almost $80 million were designated for this port entry in order to modernize. San Jerónimo. San Jerónimo is the opposite port of entry to Santa Teresa, which um, means uh, the site of Chihuahua and New Mexico, respect respectively. San Jerónimo represents a new border model. It will be the crossing border of the 21 century. San Jerónimo Federal Highway 2 was identified as a needing expansion design and lighting over uh, 11 miles sections. The new three, almost four miles, Anapra bypass will connect Juarez and San Jerónimo and 20 miles highway bypass to the Guadalupe Tornillo is currently in progress to be completed in 2023. So we're working really hard in order to strengthen in order to improve our borders and have this connection uh, with the U.S. 
All the stakeholders in this task force are unanimously focused on building dignified and efficient border crossings to support the economic development for both nations. US and Mexican governments are engaged, each with plans of multi-billion dollars investments on both sides of the border. So thank you so much, Lila, and thank you so much uh, for letting me be part of this eight uh, border conference. And I'm at your service for any question or any comment. Thank you, Governor Campos, for being here with us today. We're going to have a question and answer session. I'm going to begin uh, with one question, and then we'll open it up to the audience as well as to our virtual um, participants. So, Governor Campos, I, I want to go back to the Binational Infrastructure Task Force. Um, both you and Congresswoman Escobar made reference to it, and I know that there's uh, joint plans for this task force in terms of infrastructure, security, economic development. But how do you think, Governor, that this task force will further um, Chihuahua-U.S. cooperation? Well, um at this day, it's um, a final report that has been prepared. And this report demonstrates that uh, in order to bring the border region into the 21st century, there must be significant investments at the federal, state, and local levels in addition to increased collaboration. So our report sets the stage for better communication between our partners while following, um, while I'm sorry, while well, allowing us to better understand how to achieve these goals and more. Uh, with this report that we have uh, created, uh, we will present it to Ambassador Salazar and we will receive um, a certain amount of budget from the US uh, national government in order to strengthen our borders in uh, infrastructure um, matters. One one last question uh, for you on my end, uh, Governor Campos. I, I know that the state of Chihuahua has implemented the Sentinela Programa or the Sentinel Program to combat crime, utilizing artificial intelligence, drones, surveillance cameras. In your experience, has this program helped to facilitate and make trade more secure on the border with the United States? Yes, you know, uh, months ago, we had a meeting with uh, CBP we had uh, with the Customs Border Patrol and the Homeland Security Investigations, and also with the State Department in order to create um, to create um, programs and create uh, relationships in order to uh, solve the problems on security. And also, we are creating this uh, program that you say, Plataforma Sentinela, or Sentinel Platform, which means um, um, governance models uh, to inhibit um, insecurity and um, decrease crime rates in Ciudad Juarez and in the state. This is an investment of more than $2,000 million, uh, which is all technology, and it will uh, prevail in Ciudad Juarez, and it will help us to um, uh, change um, Intercambiar to, to exchange information to the U.S. in order to have uh, this mirror among the U.S. what you are needing and what do we need in order to to um, to create a better environment in in safety. Thank you, Governor. And now I I don't know if our audience here has any questions for the governor. I mean, I have a lot of questions that I want to ask, but yes, um, if you can please introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Governor, thank you so much for being present here today at, at, uh, at the session. We appreciate your input and your information. Thank you. My name is Dante Galeazzi with the Texas International Produce Association. Uh, so this infrastructure task force that, that we've heard about this, this morning is very interesting, and I just wanted to understand or know Will water, water retention, water delivery, and water movement be among the topics that are discussed, not just roadways and railways, because drought is significant, uh, especially in the southern United States and in Texas. Uh, but we also know that northern Mexico is starting to experience those conditions as well. So just want to understand how water will play a role in that task force job. Thank you. 
Were you able to hear that, Governor Campos? No. Okay, well, I, I'm i sorry. I will try my best. <laughs> I will try my best. Okay, I think he has a, a microphone, because if not, I would have butchered your... Your question. No worries. Okay. No worries. I I'll, I'll make it brief. Okay. First off and foremost, thank you so much for today's comments. We appreciate everything, and we appreciate everything that, that you're doing. Um, my name is Dante Galeazzi. I'm a representative with the Texas International Produce Association. Um, and one of the question I had was this task force that we've heard about, how will they be looking at water? Water retention, water delivery, water quality. Uh, as we start to experience significant drought, and now she's gone. Oh, no, there we go. Uh, as we start to to, to uh, approach significant levels of drought throughout the southern United States uh, and through northern Mexico, just want to understand how water will play a role uh, in the job of the task force moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we're working... Um, we're working, first of all, with the priorities. Uh, we were um, committed to, um, to understand where the priorities under the border were, were to be taken. Uh, that means New Mexico, that means Texas, that means a bridge, that means uh, customs. And then we will look for these conditions that we need for investment, like energy, like land, and of course, for water. And let me tell you that under my government in the state, we are looking for more, um, for, for um, new ways in order to, to, to um, found out um, Sue Minister of Water. But that's, that's the only thing that I can tell you right now about what we're doing on, on water. We're looking for it and we are exploring uh, ways to, to have the conditions that you need uh, as a border in order to, to have water. Thank you, Governor. Is there any other questions from our audience? Okay, well, Governor, I have a question from our virtual audience. Um, could you speak a, oh, okay, there she is. Um, could you speak a little bit about cross-border cooperation on health? What are the experiences and lessons that Chihuahua has learned from COVID-19? Yes, it's a, I think that health already it's a condition for a government, no matter which uh, level of government we're talking about. It's in Mexico, it's supposed to be uh, a matter and a faculty from the federal government health. But now uh, with the with the COVID, uh, uh, we this this is a condition from the state government and the local government, which means that uh, we have to tell investors, we have to tell everybody in the world what uh, what is our rate of of um, of uh, COVID, what is our um, capabilities at the hospitals, and what are the regions that we have more uh, more more focus. So right now, um, this is uh, um, um, this is a condition that we have a state government, and this is what we're doing with the cooperation with the with the U.S. to give this information and to try to to um, to reply good practice in order to to diminish the the pandemia. Thank you. And one last question for you, Governor. I know that you've made a call to other governors on the border, on the Mexican side of the border, to create a united front so that there could be an advancement in economic development, but also counter possibly some federal policies that do not favor uh, the northern part of Mexico. Do you believe that creating a united front is an actual possibility, given that a lot of governors have different political perspectives? I really believe that the governance model everywhere in the world, it's, um, it's local and all politics is local as Tip O'Neill said once in Washington DC. I think that um, um, all the issues and all the matters uh, uh, have a, um, 
they arrive to the border. I mean, we have migration, we have health problems, we have security problems, and no matter if they are from the federal government or if they are from the state government, you have to take care of those uh, of those matters, and you cannot stand idly and say those are not my problems, and I cannot take. Um, um, I cannot take care of them. So I think that uh, uh, this uh, governance model um, obligate us in order to solve these demands and these necessities from people. Thank you, Governor Campos. I, I don't know if you wanna give any concluding remarks. We are extremely grateful for your time and your presence at this conference today. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you. And I can tell you that we have the best uh, um, willingness in order to cooperate with the U.S. We know the importance of the relationship with the U.S. That's why we are having these meetings with the intelligence and security agencies at the, at the um, great, at the highest level in order to, to be really good neighbors and in order to put some uh, order in migration, people smuggling, money laundering, and drug trafficking. We know that it's a win-win situation if we collaborate and we work together. So thank you so much for this opportunity, Lila, and thank you to everyone. Thank you, Governor Maru Campos of the state of Chihuahua. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now we will hear some recorded remarks from Senator Kirsten Cinema. In a minute. I'll give it one more second. Okay. Hello, I'm Kirsten Cinema, Arizona senior US Senator. I'm honored to join you all today to discuss the importance of finding bipartisan common sense solutions to our country's challenges at the southern border. I was born and raised in southern Arizona, so for years I've seen how Arizona border communities pay the price for the federal government's failure to fix our broken border management and immigration systems. In Washington, too many politicians retreat to their partisan corners when discussing and debating border security and immigration policy. Those of us from border states know that stronger border security healthy cross-border trade, and a fair immigration system all go hand in hand. We can, and we must, achieve all three. At the border, I've seen firsthand the need for a smart, comprehensive approach to security. Implementing innovative technology solutions along the border is vital for stopping narcotics and other illicit goods from entering the country. That's why I've worked to secure over $300 million for border security technology at in between ports of entry in this year's federal spending package. And I was proud to work with my friend, Republican Senator John Cornyn, to pass into law our Southwest Border Security Technology Improvement Act. Our new law requires the Department of Homeland Security to identify border security technology gaps and develop strategies to meet them. The bill represents a key step towards refocusing on some of our most critical border challenges, such as improving security at our ports of entry. The security and efficiency of our ports of entry directly affects the health of our state's economy. Last year, Arizona imported over $9 billion worth of goods from Mexico, and Arizona exports totaled over $8 billion, a 17% increase from 2020 when industries across our state were suffering losses from COVID-19. The goods and services traded between Arizona and Mexico power jobs across our state. And often, families who live along both sides of the border are the very workers supporting cross-border trade and keeping the center of our economy strong. However, security challenges persist. Criminals try to get drugs into this country any way possible. In December, CBP officers at the Mariposa Port of Entry in Nogales seized more than 3,200 pounds of hard narcotics in one day. We must find a way to balance the need to secure our borders with the importance of fostering a healthy cross-border economy. That's why when I was tasked with negotiating our bipartisan infrastructure law, I secured historic funding modernizing, improving, and expanding our land ports of entry. These investments will improve border security while increasing the efficiency of our cross-border trade, 
supporting jobs, and fueling our economy. Right now, headlines are dominated by news of the current migrant crisis and impending migrant surge. While many in, title, in Washington debate Title 42, Arizona cities and towns along our border shoulder the burden of the federal government's lack of preparation, communication, and coordination. I recently visited Yuma, Arizona, where the chief border patrol agent reported encountering over 1,000 migrants a day. Non-governmental organizations across Arizona are stepping up to care for these migrants. To keep up with the increasing numbers, these NGOs need access to federal support that ensures migrants are treated humanely and have access to transportation services to safely reach their sponsors across the country. That's why as chair of the Senate Border Management Subcommittee, I was proud to secure over $150 million in emergency food and shelter program funding that will help Arizona communities like Yuma, but more must be done. Title 42 is not a permanent solution, but lifting Title 42 without resources in place to execute a realistic plan will exacerbate an already strained system, endangering migrants and the health and safety of our border communities. We need to put the politics of division and the exasperated cable news rhetoric aside and focus on real solutions to address the problems our communities along the border and our country face. That's why I've repeatedly called on the administration to develop and implement a realistic workable plan that ensures migrants are treated fairly and humanely while keeping our border secure. And I've made clear that this plan must be made in coordination with our local leaders and the men, women, and non-governmental organizations on the front lines of the border crisis. The administration must put the resources in place to protect the health and safety of migrants seeking asylum in Arizona communities. I partnered again with Republican Senator John Cornyn of Texas to introduce bipartisan legislation ensuring the federal government can improve its ability to manage the current border crisis and provide for stable, safe, and efficient border management into the future. Our Bipartisan Border Solutions Act creates regional processing centers and surges resources improving the asylum process and DHS's transportation capabilities at the border, reducing the impact of migrant surges on local communities, ensuring that migrants are treated fairly and humanely, and improving how we manage the border. Secretary Mayorkas has expressed support for the goals of our bill and is working to implement our regional processing centers model and we'll continue building the bipartisan coalition needed to pass it into law because our legislation represents a workable solution to help manage the flow of migrants now and create a better immigration system down the road. We must be thoughtful and realistic about the current migrant crisis. Our border communities rise to the challenge time and time again to help those in need, and it's our duty to ensure critical support to help them in this mission. There's a lot to get done before we've solved our nation's immigration challenges, and we won't accomplish anything if Congress remains consumed by partisan warfare. I remain committed to working across the aisle to secure our border, keep Arizonans safe, and ensure migrants are treated fairly and humanely. The U.S.-Mexico border has its challenges. It is also a vibrant, beautiful, and diverse place that is critical to growing my state's economy, tackling inflation, and creating more opportunity for Arizona families. I know by staying laser focused on delivering solutions instead of finger pointing, we'll be able to achieve lasting results for our country and our border communities in need. Thank you, and I hope you all have a productive conference. We thank Senator Sinema for her remarks this morning. We are now going to go to lunch in a, in a couple of minutes, in case you didn't fill up on bagels and pastries outside. Um, lunch is right around the corner. Um, we are going to be joined by Ambassador Mexican Ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Esteban Moctezuma, and Ambassador, U.S. Ambassador to Mexico, Ken Zalazar. They will be delivering the keynote address. Um, if you could please join us for lunch at the Wilson Center Dining Room right across from the auditorium. We'd be happy to have you there. Um, we will take a short break uh, before we go inside into the dining room, possibly five to 10 minutes, and then we'll start with lunch. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>